You know, over the years, I have observed a lot of conversation in and around fursuits from soon-to-be fursuiters vibrating over the moment they received their fursuit from their maker to many furries aspiring to become a fursuit maker themselves. I mean, the thought of having a career making fursuits for others, bringing their vision to life, sounds very rewarding and peak level of artistic expression. But with an art form that is very special and holds a deep connection to us in the fandom, is it a dream job that will lead you to a very comfortable living and fill your heart? Or is there more to this highly respected art form and career path behind the curtain? So I think a great way to gain perspective on fursuit making and its rise in the fandom is to go back to the beginning, tackling some of the history involving fursuits and its growing career ventures. So let's start by giving a definition of what fursuits and fursuiting are in regards to the furry fandom. Fursuits are custom-made anthropomorphic animal costumes owned and worn by cosplayers and members of the furry fandom, commonly known as furries. And a furry who wears a fursuit is called a fursuiter. So the term is believed to have been coined in 1993 by Robert King. And unlike mascot suits, which are usually affiliated with a team or organization, fursuits can be representative of an original character created by their wearer and are often better fitted and more intricately crafted. Fursuits are also made in a wide range of styles, from cartoonish to highly realistic. Fursuiting as a permanent feature and practice within the fandom lightly dates back to pre-convention era from 1984 to 1989, when the first furry parties were being organized at both sci-fi conventions and home parties. By Conference Zero in 1989, which was the first hotel-based furry convention, a programming track called Furry Costuming was held at the hotel at which it took place. Artists and fursuiters Bob Hill and Sean Keller are regarded as the first and second true fursuiters in the fandom. I will note that there has been back and forth between who was the first fursuiter, Bob Hill or Sean Keller. So Sean Keller, fursona Cheshire Cat, previously Uncle Buck, was a freelance animator and illustrator from the US who worked at Walt Disney Animation Studios from 1979 to 2004. He was one of the first members of the fandom to build a cartoon style fursuit and known for his complex builds. He was also being a contributor of the Fursuit Fat Q and was a member of the Rars Brazzle. Robert Hill was a former professional Disney mascot, whose first fursuit was Annabelle the Bear, made in 1987. Soon after, he wore the renowned fursuit based on the feminine character Hilda the Bamboid, appearing at the first ever furry convention, Conference Zero, in 1989, where mostly all furries at the time simply wore ears and tails. Fursuits did not become widely known until the mid-1990s and the rise of the internet, which led to the spread of the ideas on costume making. Most early fursuit making was done by the suit's owner using guides released by members of the community, with one of the most prominent being the Critter Costuming, a 2004 manual by Adam Riggs. However, by the mid-2000s, a demand for high-quality fursuits was high enough that fursuit making became a viable business. Furries began to commission specialized makers with their custom designs or open-ended requests. Including used suits, the industry now sells hundreds of thousands of dollars of suits each year. According to Forbes in 1918, a few fursuit makers in recent years have gained a large audience by making mascots for mainstream organizations and sports teams. So probably not surprised to many, fursuiting hasn't been around that long when you compare it to the grand scale of things within its realm, like professional mascotting, sci-fi and anime cosplay, to name a few. Now the reason I bring this up first, before diving deep into fursuit making and the hard facts and realities of making it a career, is because it's still very much growing in all aspects of a business and art form, given it's only been around for roughly 25-30 years. From the introduction of new technology and having access to revolutionary techniques in the manufacturing parts and materials, to innovating designs and methodologies to ultimately produce high-quality fursuits. As a community, we will continue to push the boundaries of fursuit making, and will inevitably reach new heights in the pursuit of creating the stunning walking works of art. Plus, let's not forget that the furry fandom is growing. And by growing, I mean a lot. Cons went from having roughly a couple hundred to several hundred attendees, which was considered a lot at the time, to having 17,000 plus like the current Anthrocon this year. And cons are going to continue to grow, and not surprisingly, some will reach 20,000 plus in a few years, if not sooner. So, we can of course conclude that if the furry fandom is growing, the demand for fursuits is growing as well. Well, you would be right. For science, the public face of the International Anthropomorphic Research Project, IARP, has been conducting and collecting research data on many aspects of the furry fandom, one being on the topic of fursuits. 
In one study, participants were asked a series of questions about their current and future likelihood to own a fursuit. The results indicated that only about 10-50% to of furries actually own a fursuit. Though the results also indicate that far more, nearly 50% are interested in acquiring one. Additionally, only about 25% of furries own a partial fursuit, with many more interested in owning a partial fursuit in the future. So, where the data therefore dispels the common misconception that all furries are fursuiters, it does show a rising interest in fursuiting or wanting to own one. Another example showed that at Anthrocon 2018, they found that 45.8% of furries owned either a full or partial fursuit that attended the convention and close to 60% at Nordic FuzzCon this year. So, as the fandom grows, that percentage grows and more so the amount of furries that want to own a fursuit. And let's not forget that that doesn't even cover furries that own multiple fursuits. So with all this knowledge you have up to now, you're probably going Coda. This all sounds pretty positive and lucrative. I think I'm gonna hop on this career path right away and don't look back. Well, I hold on for just a second. Like any business and career path, there is much to consider outside of just demand alone. So let's look at these aspects of fursuit making from the good, the bad, to the ongoing conversations around it that is leading much to debate amongst members of the furry community. Now a topic that any business likes to address is the temperature of the market, i.e. is it hot or cold, and how many players are in the game. And it comes to no surprise to us that fursuit making is a niche industry and in that we cater directly to the furry fandom, which is a small percentage of the overall population of the world. This can be a plus and minus for several reasons. On the plus side, competition might not be as fierce as, let's say, opening up a restaurant or a clothing company. Industries in which new players seem to pop up on the daily basis, trying to get a piece of the pie. Nevertheless, everyone needs to eat and needs the essentials like clothing to survive, so it's a huge pool to pander to. Fursuits, on the other hand, are not a necessity and thus are considered a luxury item. This can make the market you are selling to smaller since you can live without a fursuit, and even smaller from there since you are catering to an already small community base within a niche interest. Of course, you can expand out to other markets like appealing to corporate companies, sports teams, and more, but realistically, a vast majority of fursuit makers work for the fandom and for the fandom alone. I will say this can be a plus in that a niche market could have more control over setting their own standards within the market itself, like creating stronger standards for quality control, pricing, and performance expectations. So if you're a bigger fish in a small pond, you could be selling your products like a fursuit at a higher price, but within reasonability. Also, as we mentioned before, the Phantom is growing and will continue to grow with a decent percentage owning a fursuit, wanting to own another, and others highly contemplating buying one. So, with a growing furry community, there will be lots of buyers looking for a maker to bring their fursona to life. Now, with all these factors laid out, is the fursuit making business oversaturated knowing these facts? Well, where some of the fandom stands today, I would say some may argue just a tiny little bit, but with big caveats. So let me explain. Doing research over websites and articles spanning over roughly 12 years, I found websites that list what fursuit makers were active at the time or registered as a fursuit maker in the fandom. I found one made in 2012 listing a total of 185 fursuit makers. Now, that's not bad, but it's really not that many when you think of the entirety of the fandom. But another list in 2018, there was around 120 fursuit makers, but it wasn't fully completed yet. Now, fast forward to 2021, a list was last updated of all the makers that currently have reviews on Fursuit Review, totaling 568 Fursuit makers. And in 2024, the Fursuit Maker database called Spawnbase of the Furries, which the data is maintained exclusively by the makers, now has a total of 679 Fursuit makers from 40 countries listed. Now, it would be safe to say that not all these Fursuit makers still operate today or at a high capacity. And some might not even do a fursuit or two a year as a hobby and not a mainstay of income. However, even if 40% of that most current list is inactive or producing at a very small scale, that still leaves potentially 408 fursuit makers striving to make their main source of income and career. And that's not to say new makers won't make their debut this year too. This research shows that there definitely has been an increase in fursuit makers over the years, but also a very healthy demand for wanting these fuzzy luxury items. So again, 
Some maybe will argue just a little tiny bit oversaturated in some ways, which allows a variety of styles and budgets to exist, but also gives new fursuit makers an ample opportunity to break into the business and establish themselves as the many other well-known makers in the fandom. Now, will it produce an ample opportunity to make a comfortable living off of making fursuits alone? Now, that is another topic which poses several questions and situations to be explored, which we will go into next. Now, if you're a fursuit maker or just starting out, selling your fursuit at a reasonable cost is not only important to you to survive and maintain a sustainable living, but also to drive and entice customers to wanting to buy your product, making your suit obtainable to the furry community you are marketing to. So again, it's no surprise when it comes to fursuits and the price to acquire one, you hear topics and debates flooding the internet. From what is the average cost if you buy a fursuit, to what you should be acceptable for pricing, notions of fursuit inflation, some fursuit auctions have gone for, and more. So let's approach this from the perspective of a fursuit maker and what it takes to make a fursuit from start to finish. Now, I have personally worked at a fursuit studio myself before, but I am not a fursuit maker. So I'll be going over research I have acquired from reading discussions and articles from several fursuit makers at different skill levels over the years and discussions from furries surrounding the topic. Let's start with the cost breakdown in making a fursuit. So first, there is the material cost going into making a fursuit. Depending on the design and complexity of it, if there is any accessories or features, if they may have like wings, pouches, horns, or antlers, also their paw types, if it's plenty grade or a digigrade suit, and if it needs any muscles or added padding, it can drastically change the cost. We also need to buy the fur to make the fursuit which many makers typically recommend one to two yards for just the head, two to four yards for a partial, and five to seven for a full suit. Now, like all things, fox fur is more expensive than it was 20 years ago. One maker mentioned a yard fur about 10 years ago was $20 for good quality, and nowadays it can go upwards to $25 to $50. And even if we didn't go off that, the estimated revenue of the fox fur for apparel in the U.S. has gone up between one to two billion each year over the last several years. So the demand and profits are up, meaning costs can go up on top of the inflation. So for a typical planning grade full fur suit, the estimated cost of materials range from three hundred to five hundred dollars, quoted from several sources. So now I'm sure you're saying, as a fur suit maker, wow. I can make this for that much more than what I paid for, so the return on investment is like a big win. And for the customers, you're probably reading this saying, well then why the hell do fursuits cost that much? I guess everyone is right as well in that fursuit inflation is a real thing and fursuit makers are just making it rich. Okay, both sides have to hold on a second and take a breath. And release all of those sounds that are trapped in your mind. Ah, okay, good. Now there is much more that meets the eye outside of just material costs. Let's start with skilled labor cost. The skill it takes to make your fursuit, plus the amount of painstaking years a maker spends learning and honing their craft to make their fursuits. You are paying them for their style and aesthetic, and we know that they just didn't wake up one morning with the skills in hand. And if they have an employee working under them, that adds even more to the cost to run their business. Equipment. Unless a fursuit maker is hand sewing everything, most likely they have tools they are implementing in the construction process. So outside scissors, hot glue guns, brushes, and lesser costing supplies, we're talking about sewing machines, sergers, 3D printers, and devices for molding and heating, and more. Equipment can cost thousands of dollars and a couple hundred to maintain if something goes awry. And of course, some of these things are a one-time purchase for many years, but you still have to consider the cost and also the skill and time taken to learn how to use them. Now time. Fursuits take time to make, and some take longer than others. Again, that can come down several factors, like the complexity and additions of the fursuit to the skill and experience of the fursuit maker to the materials and equipment used. Now researching about these timeframes from makers, I get hours ranging from about 75 to 200 on average to complete a typical planning grade full fursuit. But again, this doesn't factor in time spent communicating with the client, going over details of the fursuit, brainstorming process, and laying out the important things before starting construction. So there is additional time put into this process as well. Also, this doesn't take into consideration from learning new things and techniques, research and development, and updating aspects of the business and the crafting process. So why does all this matter to someone wanting to be a fursuit maker and to the customers wondering why fursuits cost what they do? Because you are paying for a service and skill, and it's no different if you hire someone to build, let's say, a fence for your backyard. For example, 
My friend constructed his own fence himself and it cost him $6,000. But that's not including, of course, their personal time spent and labor. Now, my other friend got his fence replaced by a skilled fencing company and paid $19,000 to have it done. Fursuits and the crap behind it is no different. Skills, tools, knowledge, and materials, all of these things you may or may not have and are important factors to change and consider when a maker prices out a fursuit and for a customer to acknowledge when commissioning one. But wait, there's more. Hold up. What do you mean that there is more, Coda? So as a fursuit maker, there are outside economic and financial factors in and around this career path, along with the daily drudges of being an adult. <laughs> So expenses and time outside just making suits is important because you have to sell yourself and get out there in the world. That comes from running a website and paying for it, time networking and posting on social media, maybe making enough money to go to a con or connect with other makers and artists and mingle, maybe print business cards or run a booth. All these cost time and money and add up. <laughs> Trust me. So side note, prepaid fees are also a thing too running your business. Every electronic payment service will charge fees for using them, and the fees are fairly comparable between PayPal, Square, and Stripe. Taxes. Taxes are a real thing, and as a self-employed crafter, you have to pay taxes on every fursuit that you make, and it isn't cheap. In the US, a very rough rule of thumb is to plan to pay 30% in taxes and 30% back in the business in material and upkeep, which means of what you collect per hour, you can expect to only keep around half of it, or potentially less. Healthcare. So unless if you're under the age of 25 or on your parents' insurance and have a spouse that can cover you, you have to pay unsubsidized health insurance. And the good health insurance can cost around $5,040 a year on average, which is about around $400 a month under the Affordable Care Act, and that isn't even top tier coverage. Plus, depending on what you got, you might still have to pay out of pocket for medication and doctor visits. Rent. <laughs> Rent is a thing, and for most of us, it really hasn't gotten cheaper. So as of June 2024, a recent analytical website has a list of living wages for a single person in each state, ranging from $45,906 in Mississippi to $50,087 in Louisiana. Smart Asset also has a 2024 study that estimates the pre-tax salary needed to live comfortably in the 99 US cities with an average of $96,500 for a major city. And in my state of Washington alone, the medium rent is 2.2K as of February 2024. So other things I'll list are car payments, gas, utilities, emergency funds, unexpected and expected bills, and don't forget food. I mean, you gotta eat, right? I've got nothing left. I've got nothing left. And finally, inflation is a real thing and affects all of these things, including the rise in the price of fursuits. So everything goes up, you have to adjust your pricing to compensate for the change in the economic and financial straits of the world. And again, unfortunately, everything isn't going to get any cheaper and it looks to continue on that path. Remember when movie theaters used to be 25 cents to a couple dollars and they go now around 10 to 20 bucks. Gas was around 90 cents to $1.20 in the 2000s and now it's upwards to $6 US in some states, mine being around $5. And we briefly talked about how Fox for prices are going up along with the material needed to make them. Now, I know that there has been talk around inflation when it comes to fursuits in two parts. One is the rise in the price in fursuits overall, and then there's the talk of fursuit inflation as inflating the overall cost of fursuits. Listing everything I have said up to this point, we all have to realize that charging the same price for a full suit 20 years ago, even 5 to 10 years ago, is just not feasible. By doing so, a fursuit maker will undoubtedly lose money, if not break even, or worse, make no money and be in a financial straits, i.e. in the black. So, a $1,500 full planning grade suit, as the norm, is just not in the cards when keeping up with the cost of living. Doing a quick breakdown to give a base example of a fursuit maker taking on just one fursuit commission a month, let's say that they charge $4,000 for a fursuit. A customer uses PayPal making two $2,000 transactions. That's $116.60 in fees. Now material costs, let's say they spend $400. Now take in the account of taxes around 30% at the $4,000 price point, that'll be $1,200. Okay. Now we're at $2,283.40 in profit so far. Now, let's take out a few examples, but not all of them, that you pay in a month. 
Let's say that rent is at $600, which is low for most people, mind you. Food at $200, healthcare at around $400, and outside basic expenses for $100. Now we're at $983.40 profit. Now finally, let's take time and labor hours into the mix. If you work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and it takes you four weeks to complete a $4,000 fursuit, you end up with $25 an hour. So, knowing all of this, you are working on one fursuit a month, making $25 an hour, averaging $983.40 profit, with exemption to any emergencies, extra spending, necessity buys, putting money back into your business that month, or more making your average income around $48,000 a year without taking out any expenses. So leaving you an actual takeaway income of $11,800.80 a year. So those long trips, owning a place of your own, investing in a retirement or future, <laughs> that's not really in the cards if you follow this example. And the increase from the 2022 living wage rate of $17.70 an hour to the 2023 rate of $20.10 an hour to the new 2024 rate of $22.10 an hour reflects the significant increase in the cost of housing in our community. As noted before in this video, a living range ranges from a minimum 46K a year to the 99 US cities with an average of 96.5K a year. LA says you should be earning $40 an hour, and my state of Washington says you should be earning an hourly wage of around $41.90 an hour. So to conclude, those $2,000 fursuits again are not feasible at all to live off of, let alone to grow as a full-time fursuit maker. So fursuit makers, do not be afraid to charge a fair wage for yourself so you don't put yourself in a bad situation. And as a customer, hopefully you will also show why prices have been rising for an item that again is a luxury item, not a necessity. But Coda, what about the other inflation factor, the so-called fursuit inflation, and the crazy fursuit auctions going for insane amounts of money? Well, there is a reality of those unique situations. Popularity and supply and demand are a thing, no matter if it's fursuits or cars or designer clothing. So if a very popular fursuit maker that everyone is in love with decides to make a banger fursuit for auction, or decides one day that they're going to make two fursuits a year, for example, and opens up an auction slot for it, prompting hundreds of furs wanting to get their hands on it, buyers are going to go big, especially if they can afford it. Because popularity is a factor and demand matters, and there is a lot of demand still out there. Examples include Multicolor Barks fursuit auction in October of 2023 video at $22,600 US. Zuri Studios of 50K USD fursuit in May of 2021. Mixed Candy's Manuel Dog at $17,127 US in 2018. And the Sniper the Angel Dragon at $11,575 US in 2015. Now, if you did inflation, it would be $15,560.41 USD in 2024. But these are not the norm. Now, would you go pay that much for a fursuit? That's up to you. Some people buy shoes at a normal retail store for $50, and some wait in line overnight to get a $300 Jordan. Do you agree with the prices? Again, with all these factors laid out in this video, and even more I haven't even covered, that's for you to decide. Just note that it does show the potential a fursuit maker can reach, which honestly is very motivating and exciting for someone wanting to break into the business, and you could be one of them. But also know again that this isn't the norm, and don't think it really sets a standard, but again, highlights its potential. Now finally, the last but certainly not least, and arguably one of the most important things to a fursuit maker and a furry commissioner, is time to completion. This is not only essential to both sides, but can be detrimental to a fursuit maker and the experience of their customers. You probably have heard on social media, in friends groups, or review sites like Ours Beware of customers having horrible experiences with getting their fursuits completed, and fursuit makers having a very hard time balancing their time management. Now, for the sake of this conversation, we are going to approach this outside the act of God scenarios, where a fursuit maker or customer has something happen that deviates the process and sends things into chaos. As a fursuit maker, it is your job and obligation to your customers to stick to a reasonable time frame in completing their fursuits. Period. Fursuit making is not an exception to this rule. Like, would you hire someone to, let's say, paint your house and then have them practically ghost you for a year, coming into like once in a blue moon to say hi, paint for a few hours, and then disappear again? 
Would you go to a restaurant and have a waiter take over an hour to sit you and take your order? And then another two hours just to eat your food, only to ask if you're doing okay once? No, you wouldn't. And you shouldn't. Because businesses thrive on transparency and creating realistic expectation and deadlines for their clientele. Now, you're all probably saying, well, Coda, then they should only take on one commission, then finish it quickly and then open up once it's done. Or better yet, don't take on several commissions and make some customers wake up to a year to get their fursuits. Well, unfortunately, that is not possible, nor sustainable, nor advisable for a fursuit maker to do if they want to survive not only monetarily, but as a full-time business. Here is why. Full-time fursuit makers need to take on several commissions at a time so to not lose money, but also budget their expenses for that time frame. If they have 30 requests and only constantly take on two commissions out of the 30, that could create a situation where they might have a very fast turnaround time, but lose a lot of potential clients since their chances of getting a slot is like 6%. Also, as I stated earlier in this video, making just one $4,000 fursuit a month, for example, would destroy your finances. But I mean, you'd be super fast, so that's all good, right? Right? Hello darkness, my old friend I've come to talk with you again Of course, you don't want to take on 30 fursuits and tell customers that the entire queue will be done in a year and then make them wait an extra year or two. There is no integrity in that and it will plunge your reputation down the toilet. Plus, this will devalue your profit margins, dragging your finances down due to the extenuating time. This does also explain why fursuit makers can take several months or even a year to finish a fursuit and their entire queue. They are working on multiple fursuits at once to pay their bills, and they can't work on all 20 fursuits at once, for example. So, some fursuits will get started before others in the queue, meaning some customers will get their fursuits right away, and others might get theirs near the tail end of the queue. And side note, Taking on multiple fursuits also reduces administrative efforts for fursuit makers to take on more commissions in a single queue, thus focusing more on their time on producing. I work for a business director for a company that makes specialized products, for example. When we reopen for custom products, we take around 21 custom commissions and have a turnaround time of four months. So we open around three times a year. And we don't deviate from that because we acknowledge that we can and cannot accomplish in X amount of time. And we value the time of our customers, not wanting them to wait any longer than that. Plus, we budget our business around that time frame to maximize our profits so that we may pay our necessary business expenses and employees a fair wage. In the end, how you find the balance of how many fursuits to take on and creating a reasonable turnaround time that your customers can be satisfied with it's up to you as a maker, but be transparent and honest before you take on a commissioner. And as a commissioner, understand a fursuit maker has to make a living and understand that these timeframes are not too surprising if you break it down a bit when considering all these perspectives. It is doable. And with the right planning, you could be a very successful and profitable fursuit maker and have customers smiling happily, waiting at your door to commission you. I hope that if you're an aspiring fursuit maker, a longtime veteran of the craft, or a soon-to-be fursuiter, that you found value in this video and took some perspective from it. And of course, I love hearing any comments and thoughts from all of you. As always, drop a like, follow, subscribe, and until next time, stay awesome!